Well, welcome everyone. It's good to have you back. For those of you who were brave enough to come back after last week, um, we are officially in our first week of Lent. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do a quick recap of the last few days. Those of you who were able to follow in our little devotional, it's I'm going to do a quick recap of what was there. And then we'll just have hopefully a lovely conversation with these two gentlemen whom I met this morning. So in order to prevent me saying anything stupid, <clears throat> sorry, I'll have them introduce themselves in just a minute. Because if they say something stupid, it's on them, not on me, right? <laughs> That could easily happen. All right. <laughs> Can we pray together before we get started? Oh, Lord, we come in humility before you. We quiet our hearts and um, we ask that you would do what only you can do, namely to speak to us wherever we are in our own journeys with you, our own experience of Lent this year. And would you whisper your truth and your love into our ears? And as um, Kent, Jonathan, and I are um, up here, would you truly allow us to completely disappear so that you would appear and that um, our words would not be our own, that our thoughts, all of us in this room, our thoughts would not be our thoughts but yours. You are welcome here the precious, beautiful name of our King, your Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, so if you were, if you have been following in our little devotional, we started on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. Many of us were there. We'll talk about maybe some of that this week. And um, Christy said in our first devotional that we are dust, and at the same time, we have the potential to, to shine like stars in the sky. And I think this juxtaposition that she gave us to start us off this week between the holiness and the glory on the one hand and then the borrowed glory of us as image bearers in Christ. Uh, that set the tone for us on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, Jessica talked about Habakkuk, who is maybe a lesser known prophet who shares this unparalleled vision of the greatness of God amidst lightning and uh, shining and thunder and at the same time he is in total control and because of his control and his sovereignty and at the same time his great love though the fig tree shall not blossom nor the olive tree bear oil we rejoice in the Lord and just very briefly her entry re, you know is, is full of hope and I'm French, you might hear my accent, I'm French, and we've lived in the States for about eight, 10 years with my husband and family. And um, the French word for hope that is prevalent in Habakkuk is not, oh, I hope for good weather, I hope for sunshine, I hope for a good meal tonight. This is more like wishful thinking. But we have another word in French for hope that doesn't exist in English. And it's a hope that is very biblical. It's the hope of something you know for sure is going to happen, even though it has not yet taken place. So that cannot be good weather, cannot be a good meal. But there's a hope. It's called espérance in French. And espérance is rooted and only has validity in Christ alone. The only way we can have espérance in anything at all, an absolutely guaranteed future that we do not yet possess, that's in Christ. And that's espérance, and that's what Habakkuk talks about. And then we moved on the next day with an entry that Jonathan wrote. So we'll talk about him, with, about him, with him about that some uh, today a little bit. And then it has to do with anxiety. Um, and how can you rejoice in the midst of anxiety? We can talk about that. Um, and then finally, we had Bonnie talk to us about repentance. And so we had God the Father in the glory of Habakkuk. We had God the Son with Christy and with Jonathan, and now with Bonnie, it's the repentance of the human soul. It's David, and she brings us into all of this equation. Actually, I found it fascinating as I was reading day by day by day, you would think all of these authors who wrote these devotionals were in concert with one another, because there really is a progression, and that has to do with the Holy Spirit inviting each one of us into that journey through their writing, but also 
the, um, the addresses, all of the verses you were invited, the chapters you were invited to read that just make this very clear progression. And then finally, Chris today was inviting us to go beyond the mind that we already possess with that definition of repentance. Um, and that's something only the Lord can do. So that's what we talked about, what we went through, what the Lord talked to us about over the, the last few days. That continues. If you do not have this little devotional, you absolutely need to grab one. I just grabbed one more for our kids. So I think there are spare ones. Father Philip said we could take extras. So do that. Um, all right, I'm done talking. <laughs> now to the good part. Um, could you tell us briefly, each of you, uh, about you personally, who you are, maybe how long you've been at Good Sam, maybe a highlight of Lent this week for you, or Ash Wednesday, if you were here. I think, Kent, you were here. I don't know, Jonathan, if you're able to come. Uh, yeah. We were, uh, we had a little illness in our house, so. No, All right, well, no, tell no. us about how you're doing then. Yeah. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is Jonathan Yates. Uh, I have been here at Good Sam for about nine years. We started coming in 2015. Um, you might actually uh, know my wife, she's here with us, uh, Bess Yates. Uh, we have been married now for 15 years. And uh, we have one daughter who just celebrated her 10th birthday, Eliza. Uh, she's also here. Um, so just one other thing about me before we, we talk about Lent. So I am not a native Pennsylvanian. Uh, I'm actually from Georgia, so from down south, as is my wife. She's from uh, Louisiana originally, then North Carolina. Um, but I moved here uh, for a job. So I teach at Villanova University. I've been there 19 years, um, which is a pretty good place, actually. So uh, very happy there. Um, as far as Lent goes, I will talk about this maybe a little bit more, but I have to say a little bit of context that I did not grow up in the Episcopal Church. I didn't actually grow up in any church that is liturgically based. So this is uh, all still fairly new to me, the whole experience of Lent. Um, but I have found that I've, uh, I've enjoyed it. And in particular, I enjoy the whole notion, or what I see as the main point of it, is this notion of preparation. So looking ahead, thinking about what is to come, in particular, uh, of course, Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's all pretty new to me, but it is something I've, I've uh, the more experience I've had with it, the better it's gotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Jonathan and I have been in church here for years, and I think we might have just met each other for the first time. <laughs> That's one of those consequences of having multiple services. we all been there, done that. Um, so I'm Kent Sparks, and I work at Eastern University, been there for 25 years uh, as a faculty member for a long time, and then also in administration. Um, my, my wife, Cheryl, who maybe more of you know, actually, because she was on the vestry, uh, we've been married 35, pushing 36 years coming up, and a couple of daughters, 28 years old. Um, I don't know actually how long we've been at Good Sam, maybe 17 years, something like that. Uh, I should keep track of that. Um, <clears throat> Lent. You know, I, I'm experiencing Lent as sort of the beginning of a process that ends in Monday Thursday, where, you know, Jesus gives a new commandment that we would love one another as I have loved you and we would wash one another's feet. And I think that the humility of washing the feet of another person goes hand in hand with this notion that we are but ashes. And we can talk more about that in a few minutes, but I, I think we are ashes and yet we, we aren't, right? So uh, those are just some thoughts. There's a whole process of trying to get to a, a point of spiritual humility that prepares us to wash the feet of our neighbors. So those are my first thoughts. Yeah, and I think the beauty of washing, washing the feet of our neighbors is that they too are dust, but they too mm. have the breath of God upon them. And so this equality and this mutual respect, I think is, is maybe the, uh, yeah. one of the ways we can experience community over Lent. So um, you were talking about ashes and Ash Wednesday, so Kent, what, you, you know, what was your experience this, this year, just a few days ago? Yeah, I, I went through a bit of a spiritually difficult time over the last number of years. And um, so it feels a little odd. Uh, I have that mm -hmm. imposter syndrome to be up telling people, here's what you need to do to be spiritual. Uh, but I think um, we don't want to be ashes. We want to be something. We want to be something more. 
And a part of being uh, a healthy person is recognizing on the one hand, yeah, you, in a sense, you really are ashes. God took the dust and he breathed his spirit and he made you into who you are. And then, you know, you go back to that. And without the hope of the resurrection, that you shall remain. And um, there's a humility in recognizing that we are all, all of us, ashes in that sense. Um, we want to be more than that. We want to be able to look at the other people who are ashes and say, well, you're ashes, but I'm better ashes. <laughs> you know, it's really odd, right? Um, but God wants us to put us all on that same level, I think. And um, so, so for me, it was a profound sense of, of humility and solidarity with the human condition that I am ashes just as a few months ago I was in San Francisco and a guy got a guy from the street got on the bus and he sat next to me and I could barely stand the smell and I was embarrassed that I wanted to be away from him but what I did get out of that was this sense of constantly reminding myself that from God's viewpoint this is we are one we are ashes in need of redemption so it's it's been a helpful time for me and I appreciated it a lot mm. Wow, the, the humility to remember that it really, I mean, seriously, how long, how much would it take for us to be that person on the bus? Really, I mean, reversal of circumstances mm. could really happen to anyone. And so we really are equal in that. Um, even though we want to be ashes with gold dust sprinkled yeah, in, there right? You go. <laughs> Something like that. Well um, said. Jonathan, uh, you said that you were relatively new to Lent. Uh, I don't know, just is there something about Lent that has captured your imagination or your interest maybe recently? Or you're hoping it will? <laughs> uh, well, yes, certainly hoping. Uh, I would say the, the, the thing that um, it, it's been really a gradual process. Like I said, I've been, I've been coming to Good Sam here about nine years. And uh, to be completely honest, the first several years, I didn't get terribly involved in Lent. I mean, it was it was so new and and so strange, I guess, for me uh, that um, I just I, I understood what was going on, but it was just something. It was it took me a while to sort of familiarize myself with. Mm. So it has been something that is I've sort of slowly grown into, especially over the last two or three years. But as I said earlier, what, what I really have come to appreciate about it is this notion of preparation. Uh, without going into too much detail, the, the tradition that I grew up in, Easter was uh, obviously a very important day, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis in preparing for Easter. And this, the notion of, of recognizing your identity, not only in terms of being you know, in Adam and having fallen, and therefore you, that's, that's what leads to you becoming ashes, right? Um, but also the notion that through faith you are now in Christ, which of course is the hope that we all have. And, um, but this notion of preparation, the notion of, of setting your mind, and then of course with, with the various disciplines that you engage in, whether it's extra prayer or, mm. or uh, you know, the notion of sacrificing something for Lent, right? It's the notion of that you're trying to prepare not only spiritually, but mentally and then physically. So that's, it's, again, it's pretty new for me, but it's, uh, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. mm. And the fact that we're all different, so I like how you were describing so many different ex uh, expressions of Lent. I, I'd be curious if we had time. We don't, but I'd love to hear how each person is resonating with Lent in their own particular time and place right now, and how you said over the years it evolves. And I'd be curious, don't you wish, I wish sometimes I could be, I could just be a fly on the wall in 10, 20 years down the road to see how we've grown in our experience and our relationship with the Lord and the role that Lent may have played into that. That might be something to consider. Mm. Um, Kent, speaking of practices for Lent or um, imagine you're having someone who's asking you, you were saying, by the way, how you're a little, you feel like you don't belong being up here giving advice, quote unquote. We're not yep. giving advice. Please hear this. We're trying to be transparent and share the 
the flaws of our, in our own experiences and learn from one another, which is why we will have a more of a group discussion in a little bit where we want to hear from you, your questions, but also your insights into your own experience. But this being said, Kent, how would you come alongside someone who is maybe in this room or outside coming to you and asking, uh, how do you experience fre a fresh, a freshness, something different for Lent this year? Yeah, I, I want to just begin with your that comment you made about diversity of experience mm. i mean we have a room and as many as i look around and you could too you all look different and your experiences uh on your spiritual journeys are as different as you look right everybody's at a different place has different different uh strengths different weaknesses so you know i, I will just say from my vantage point the thing i focus most on is on honesty um there's a book I'm reading by a psychologist on, on kindness, and he starts off with honesty and says that's the beginning place because if you're not honest, then you're already sort of beginning your journey from a different place on the map than you're actually on. And, of course, maps don't work very well if you're starting from the wrong place. Um, I you know, read Chris's um, uh, comments this morning about metanoia, you know, changing of the mind, repentance. You can't repent unless you're willing to be honest about what is true in you, the darkness that you don't want to be there. So for me, I am uh, fasting from thoughts about feeling, um, feeling anger and frustration at others when they judge me. I don't know if that ever happens to you, if you ever feel like somebody else judges you or evaluates you in a certain way. And that can cause you to respond and not be a kind person, right? So I'm fasting when I, I see that, you know, okay, somebody's did something that doesn't feel good to me. I'm like, I'm not gonna fixate on that. Um, I'm gonna fixate on my love for that person. And um, it's been a good experience. It's a lot different than fasting from, you know, certain foodstuffs or drinks, um, but it's been helpful. And it does require much honesty. Uh, it does. Yes. So it, there's a theme there. Yeah, you got to face reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not always pretty. Mm. Uh, Jonathan, you were sharing as we were kind of preparing for this a little bit, a little bit of your frustration at all the things you were hoping to share in the devotional you're sharing with us this week. And uh, I think we feel your pain in the sense that we were limited to 300 words or something. And that's hard when there's so much we want to share. So I know that there were some insights that you were maybe not able to share fully in your devotional that was for this Friday. So tell us about your devotional, maybe some of the things you really were hoping we would capture and the things you weren't able to tell us. Uh, sure. So uh, just to, it wasn't so much that there wasn't enough room as much as it was that I felt like so many of the things that I was writing about in the devotion needed elaboration to really be perfectly clear. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to go into it a little bit, what I was thinking, so I, I did focus on a couple of the readings for the week, uh, namely the passage from Philippians and then the passage from John 17. Um, and I guess I need to say at the outset before I say a little more about anxiety, um, one of the things I would have added with a little more space is I would have offered the, the caveat that, of course, I realize that for, for a lot of people, anxiety is a genuine medical condition. Uh, and I really did, I don't really want you to perceive that I'm being dismissive of the notion that anxiety for a lot of people is a very real thing. Uh, my target is maybe more uh, on, a, on a different level the anxiety that we all experience from time to time, the more, the, the more run of the mill, the more generic version of anxiety that, um, you know, again, we all do deal with to different degrees, but at the same time, for most of us, it's not something that we need, uh, need intervention for, at least professionally. Um, so I wanted to say that up front, but at the same time, um, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the reality of anxiety um, and I wanted to make a couple of larger points. Uh, number one is I think it's a very real way of thinking about anxiety to see it as the opposite of faith. Um, what do I mean by that? That, you know, normally we say, well, there's faith and there's unfaith, there's belief and unbelief. But at the same time, if you think about what anxiety is, if you define it 
as uh, you know, a troublesome or serious concern about the future. What's going to happen? Or what is, uh, you know, whether that's long term or short term, right? Um, there's a very real sense in which anxiety, w when you give in to anxiety, you're, you are giving in to unfaith for that period of time. So um, with that having been said, I wanted to, uh, wanted to highlight the fact, which is uh, some of the, one of the things I drew out of these two readings that, that I focused on, is just to try to remind us all um, that our anxiety is absolutely not a surprise to God. That uh, it's, it's something he knows all about. And if you really, it's, it's one of those themes that I think is, is often, uh, I don't know if I would say it's underrepresented, but it maybe not, maybe isn't, doesn't always get the focus it deserves from scripture, but just exactly how much there is in scripture about it. That if you if you start uh, or just confine myself to the to the New Testament, if so, we could we could talk a lot about what's in say the Psalms about anxiety. There's a lot a lot of uh, a lot there, uh, but just to talk about the New Testament, I think if you start with Matthew and go through Revelation, you'd be surprised at how often the notion of anxiety and faith as an antidote to anxiety is addressed in scripture it is it is it is a theme that is i think undervalued but it's i think the, the signal there or at least what i draw from uh how frequently is present in scripture is just how concerned uh god is about that and not only the fact that it is the opposite of faith but what its effects can be both in the long and short term right mm -hmm. so I think we've all probably had the experience of whether it was late at night when you know the, the lights are off and you're staring at the ceiling, right? And something comes up and it and it keeps you from from being able to go to sleep, right? Just something that your just your mind starts to race or whatever, or uh, in any other uh, situation you can think of the common situ common experience of anxiety, um, and how that you know the antidote is often to remember um, to remember some of the tenets of your faith. And I, I could elaborate on uh, a lot of these, but uh, some of the things that, that came to my mind that, that I might have included with a, a little more space here is to talk about, um, you know, what Jesus has to say about anxiety in the Sermon on the Mount, right? One of, the, one of his primary uh, exhortations there is not to worry. That's, that's one example, right? And then think about the, the Lord's Prayer. The, 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 the third request of the Lord's Prayer is, is uh, let your will be done, right? Well, now, of course, in, without going into too much detail there, if you think about that from the eyes of faith, if, you, if your faith, if you, if you think about God's character, right, and who the God is that you're praying to when you pray the Lord's Prayer, his goodness, his care, his concern, his control, all the things, all the things you might list under God's attributes, right? When you say, let your will be done, I think there's a real sense in which that is an anti-anxiety sort of prayer. Yeah, right? thank you. That's, mm -hmm. that's really, really good. Um, that makes me wonder, Kent, <coughs> do you see any connection between the honesty and the anxiety? Does being honest create any anxiety for you as you are pondering this or vice versa? Or uh, Yeah, in fact, I, I think <clears throat> Anxiety probably plays an important role in not being honest, right? Because mm -hmm. we fear that something might be true about us or about our situation. And it's painful to admit that X or Y or Z is true of you, that you are petty, that you are easily angered, that you are impatient, right? You don't, we don't want to say that we're not the fruits of the Spirit uh, because we fear that if it were true, we wouldn't be lovable and others yeah. wouldn't love us. And the paradox of that is frequently it's precisely the anxiety that leads to the lack of honesty that's causing the breakdown in relationships. It's not actually fixing anything, it's actually making it worse. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, an inner relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that it's interesting, this notion that we're ashes has a certain power to it, right? Because if you read the psalm that most often it gets quoted or along this, Psalm 103, he knows that we are but dust. The, the implication in the psalm is that, and that's why he's patient with us, right? He doesn't say you're dust and so you're worthless. It's that you're dust and so he's patient with us. And the more we 
I remember early on in our marriage, Cheryl one time said to me, because I had a lot of spiritual anxiety, she said, you know, we're just, he knows we're but dust. And if we could internalize that with each other too, right? Look, you're having a hard time. We're not getting along, right? We're, we're but dust here. Come on, right? I think it lowers the threshold of expectation and gives people freedom to be honest. Um, but, you know, this side of heaven, it's a tough road. Mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is for freedom. Like Christ has set us free, therefore let us not be enslaved to a yoke of slavery. Mm -hmm. But that's easier said than done. It is. And dishonesty is an easy Paul yoke said of a slavery. Lot of like he that. did, didn't he? Man. Yeah, he's... <laughs> so um, there's a lot we're hoping to discuss, but we really want you to be a part of the conversation. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to you guys for a little bit. There's some additional thoughts we were hoping to share, but I think we're going to hear from you, your thoughts on this week, anything at all that uh, spoke to you in any, from any of the devotionals, we'd love to have a conversation with you about it. And then time permitting, maybe we'll go back to a specific entry um, that we, um, we wanted to highlight a few things on. But first, so we have Marianne somewhere with a mic. There she is. So I think there's a gentleman here with a question if you want to raise your hand. And you're going to speak into the mic to make sure everyone can hear your question. Yeah. Thank you. Question and observation, yes. Uh, just to uh, follow up on that one word Ken used, the word worthless. Um, Paul Tillich wrote a classic book, he's a theologian, called The Courage to Be. Mm -hmm. There's another side to anxiety that um, I guess I'll be honest with you, I, I, I experience. And it's not only just the fear of the future, but there's also a a feeling of fear of the, of the present, and that is in his book, he talks about anxiety of man because he's been diminished. He feels as though the fear of being nothing to anybody, yeah. no, no significance. And I felt that, uh, for example, I went down to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra about a week ago, and they played Shostakovich's Fourth Symphony. It's his biggest work the most instrumentation of any, of any of his 15 symphonies. But at the end, last few minutes, he ends it by just a quiet, solitary voice of a celesta. And you get the picture, a feeling, of a man who is thrown into a gulag, and they threw the key away, and he went into oblivion, into total insignificance. And Tillich in his book talks about in the very last chapter of Christ on the cross saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, God meets us in that emptiness. Christ emptied himself that when we feel that emptiness, that diminishment, that unimportance, that insignificance that others may have attributed to us, God meets us there in that anxiety. And that was a real comfort to me yeah. in that book. I recommend it to you. Mm. Thank you. It's a great book. Anyone else with a question, comment on anything you've read this week? Something that was said this morning? Um, Ken, I can probably hear me. Um, yeah, we want to make sure everyone can hear you if that's all right. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm down with anyway, Ken, I was just thinking about your honesty. And I wondered if you were at the point where you could define the roadblocks that you either had to get around or explain to yourself, and or did you find more, or as you've journeyed on, have you been um, able to see yourself with more, perhaps, clarity? And, and the thinking that perhaps has gone on to protect the ego within the form. Um, I think Eileen's question was, on this, uh, if we could say, journey to be honest, have you identified the roadblocks? Have you been able to, to overcome them? How are you processing those? What are, the, what are the nature of them? Am I getting in the space of your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I do believe a lot, far more than we want to admit, Freud was right, is unconscious 
and we don't realize what just like my heart is beating without me thinking about it my mind is is creating thoughts and ideas without me really attending to it so you know a lot of my work has been in therapy trying to become aware of my unconscious fears and anxieties i've also found that anxiety has not only you know fear of the irrational fear of the uncontrollable but it also has a really positive value with Tillich brings up and Kierkegaard also, which is that anxiety also can be a thing that drives us to create. And we can actually avoid being, being people who create a, a life, taking initiative because of our anxiety. Um, for me, I still feel like I'm on this journey of trying to understand the way in which I naturally respond defensively, for example, in certain cases where I'd prefer to be more open to another person's experience. And um, that's a journey for me. So I'm still looking for what is it that's triggering you that's sort of putting up that block to let the other person's world impinge on your world. Because we want to be something we're not, ultimately, all of us. And there are things I want to be that I'm not. And I hate that. <laughs> but uh, it is what it is, you know, so it is uncomfortable. I don't like it, but but it is, you know, metanoia, changing my mind is about it, facing that. Yeah. I hope that I'm getting to the. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And it's interesting as I'm hearing you, there's both the honesty with the Lord and then with one another. There's really those two dimensions. And I found I find that being like facing honestly the Lord is something that becomes possible when I'm aware and reminded of his love and his acceptance and the sacrifice of Christ. And then when I am the recipient of someone's and often my husband's kindness towards me in my lesser moments, that invites me to be more honest because it's met with, um, with love and kindness. Mm -hmm. And that's something we can offer to one another as well yeah. and reducing the anxiety at the same mm -hmm. time. Jonathan, any, any thoughts on that or? I don't know that I would have a lot to add, but just maybe to underline the, 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 the value of honesty, not only for the reasons already expressed, but I guess when I think about being honest before God, it, in the back of my head, it's always this notion that how, even though it's, it's something we all do and it's a strong temptation, how futile it is to not be honest before God. I mean, he knows it anyway, right? I mean, what, what do you, you know, the, the, the notion that you might be hiding something is sort of self-delusion. Right, yeah. yeah. Which is extremely freeing to realize we are all self-deluded and therefore there's some freedom right. to face up to reality, at a, to true reality as opposed to our perception of reality. I just think it's, you know, it's, we were talking about the, the two dimensions, the vertical and the horizontal. It's, a, it's another space where we tend to take the way we interact on the horizontal, that is with other people, where it's fairly easy to hide, right? And we, we transport that or transpose that into the vertical as if it works the same way, but of course it doesn't. Thank you, yeah. Any, any comments following up on that? Any other questions or anything that, uh, you'd like to share with us from the devotionals you've read this week? I think the most difficult part for me during Lent is I don't have problems repenting, but I keep repenting over and over and over again from things that are way back that I obviously have not forgiven myself. And maybe that's the roadblock of accepting God's forgiveness. Um, because that haunts me forever. I'm 73, some of these things happened years and years and years ago. And I don't think I, I think I have an easier time forgiving somebody that has wronged me than I do forgiving myself. Mm -hmm. And so this is a tough time for me mm -hmm. because I keep looking at it and I, I want I want to feel that true acceptance and love, mm -hmm. but I'm the roadblock. <laughs> what yeah. do you do with that? There you go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being so honest and role yeah. modeling the very thing mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Yeah, I think, um, you remember I mentioned a few 
minutes ago some of the struggles I've had spiritually over the last number of years. One of the things that I came to realize is that it's pretty inevitable that we're never fully integrated persons. We always have different thoughts and ideas floating around in our head. They're not all put together. God's ideas are put together, but ours are, you know, not always coherent. And on one level, and I don't want to reduce it to volition, but I've had to recognize, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the example, and then maybe it'll help you, right? I have always struggled with that there's a God in a world where there's a Holocaust. Yeah. I'm like, if I... I did this sound terrible. If I were God, that would be I would be like, okay, that's enough, people. We're, just, we're gonna stop right here. And he doesn't do that. And so I have to decide a part of me is like desperate to believe in God and follow God, and a part of me has trouble believing in a God who would let that happen. But those going back and forth between those two things just is not you no there's no sense of balance. So my faith decision is there's a God, he loves us, he sees the Holocaust, he hates it. And if that other thought comes in my head, I go, I see you, I know why you're there, but you're not me. You're not my thought, you're a thought of me, but you're not my primary direction. So it's always going to happen, probably for most of us, that something we've done in the past, when we bring it back up, it reignites that feeling of guilt and shame. And, but we also, a part of us knows, yeah, but that shouldn't be there. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so just being able to go, yeah, there you are. There you are. I see you. But, but that's not true. I am loved. And, and you know what? I am loved the same way God loves everybody. No matter what we've done, he loves us. Right? I don't know if that could help you, but it does help me to, to just realize I'm never fully able to get rid of those thoughts. But I can process them, and I can go, there you you're over there. You're in a box on the shelf. I put you back over there, but you're not the main thing going on in my life today. Do you find yourself reprocessing and reprocessing and reprocessing? The more I learn to put it in, back in that box and set it over there, the more I find that I'm able to go, yeah, of course you're there. What person wouldn't naturally feel some bit of sadness about something I did in the past, of which I have done much? Right? So it isn't like you're talking to somebody who doesn't have the same thing, right? But the more I learn to let that be a small part of a larger whole, rather than take, be the thing that controls my identity, the more I feel comfortable with, yeah, of course, I'm human. I have that thought. Thank you. Yeah. I can still relate to that as well. And as you were saying, both of you really, um, part of maybe what Lent could look like is to, for you to, and, and for anyone who has these kinds of thoughts that intrude and are, you know they're not truth, but you can't help them. They're impinging upon your heart, upon your soul, and they're preventing you from fullness of truth, fullness of relationship because, with the Lord, because you're, you're, stru you're stuck. Um, maybe Lent is about fasting from those thoughts and learning, as Kent is saying, to put them in a box. Instead of having right them in front of you, just put them, having one step removed from you right here, and then next week right here, and then a little further away, because as we all know, habits get formed be which, between six to eight weeks, and so those 40 days plus Sundays allow you just enough time to reform new habits, and maybe it's a fast from allowing that thought to be front and center for you. I don't know. I think I saw someone's, yes. And that's maybe our last uh, comment or question. Just a uh, comment that in a devotional that I read, mm -hmm. the uh, message was God does not expect us to be perfect, but he expects us to be and persevere in our walk, yeah. whatever that walk is. Yeah. Amen. We could talk about that. That's <laughs> Amen. Persevere, for sure. Jonathan, any final thoughts as we end? Uh, well, I guess the one thing that did occur to me, and it was in connection with the last question, and I realize this is a, another enormous can of worms, but I did want to interject the notion of, of grace into this um, because I think with one of the things I've connected to Lent and uh, the, the various uh, uh, attempts at metanoia or or sacrifice or the disciplines involved um, and certainly this goes into my larger point about anxiety or the past or memories or self-forgiveness 
Um, I, I would just, I guess as sort of a parting word, would want to remind or share with everybody something that, um, uh, that St. Augustine has a lot to say about. So without going way off into the weeds, uh, I teach historical theology at Villanova, and I, I teach actually whole classes on the thought of St. Augustine. And one of the things he says in a particularly pastoral moment, even though he is keenly aware of how grace is a gift, how it's, it's God's unmerited favor, right? Uh, at the same time, he exhorts his people to pray for grace. Like, in other words, even though, even because it's free and even because it's unmerited, that's, that still shouldn't be a barrier to pray for it. So whether it is, um, for example, getting to a place where you can, you can live easier with the past or forgive yourself or, or even to, to go to a new place in terms of your own uh, spiritual life or discipline for Lent, uh, it's, not, it's not wrong to, to, to ask God to make that a function of his grace for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Kent? Hmm. I think w w whenever I enter into a season of reflection, as we all are right now in Lent, which is new, you know, uh, like Jonathan, I grew up in a non-liturgical tradition where we got ready for Easter, you know, on Thursday. <laughs> you know, that was it. We had the foot washing and then, you know. So, uh, I think, I think my takeaway from this is, and to get back to your point, Stephanie, that it takes time to reflect and to grow. You can't do it like that. So I love that our church calendar provides this extended period of reflection. Uh, I've appreciated the way in which the leaders have put together uh, an experience that we can do together. I think it, appreciating that and noticing it's important. And I, I would just encourage all of us to realize we're on a journey you'll never arrive on this side of heaven. You are always going, right? There's always something new, something to relearn. Um, and d don't be constantly beating yourself up because there's a gap between, uh, you know, as Steve said, uh, between who we are and who we wish we were. That will always be. Um, so, thank you. Well, thank you, both of yeah. you. Um, our blessings to you as for the rest of today. If you're going to New Chapel, I think it starts in a couple of minutes. So um, let you go for that. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week.